Welcome to the Monster Marathon Midterm Madness Review Session. We are going to go, or I am going to go until, well, I don't know about the cows, but it's going to be late. Uh, someone says my beard has a subspace. No, curly hair, it's not a linear space. So no subspace, but I should mention that I have been growing this beard for charity. It's not just laziness, I am totally serious. I've entered a competition, which I will not win, but I uh, am happy to say that Monday during your spring break uh, is the competition. And after that I can do what I like, so probably I'll shave at least part of it off. Since you're all so interested, uh, apparently enough to at least one of you uh, to write a comment. So, okay, here's the plan for this evening. First, I need to finish off 3.4, 5.1, and 5.2. So that's sort of like a regular review session, but hopefully I can do it in about an hour and a half. Then we'll take a bit of a break. We may have to take a break a little bit sooner for videoing reasons and also endurance reasons. Uh, but whatever the case, we're then going to continue with a complete review of chapters 1, 2, and 3, except for 3.4. What I'm going to do now. Um, and I've got this review, it should take about an hour, and it's, ironically enough, a non-linear review of linear algebra in the sense that I'm not just going to go through the textbook in the same order, I'm going to try to categorize it, because it might be looking a little bit amorphous in your mind. So, and then after that, assuming anyone is still here, awake, conscious, whatever, uh, we will do Q&A, and of course you have a bunch of previous midterms, uh, that you've, you've got previous quiz questions, whatever. Anything that is eligible for the midterm is fair game. You can come and go as you please, just don't make too much of a disruption as you do so. Any questions before I begin with that plan of attack as I've described? All right. Okay, so I got to start on 3.4 last time and I want to sort of remind you the main points so actually working a bit from the end of 3.3, uh, but I think it really belongs with 3.4. So we sort of, we understood what a basis was. And so if you have a basis of Rn, it looks like V1 up to Vn, then these are linearly independent, and yet they also span Rn. So the way to tell this is that the matrix whose columns are the n, n vectors v1 through vn is invertible. That's the same thing. Actually, if a matrix is invertible, then its columns are a basis for Rn. It works the other way too. So we saw this. Don't want to get sort of too much into it, but on the other hand, I think it's worth bearing that in mind as we start 3.4. So this is a section about coordinates. It doesn't have to be coordinates just in Rn, so let's take a subspace. Uh, v. And I'll take subspace V of, say, Rn. So we, we have a subspace, and one thing you can do with a subspace is write down a basis. There's many different ways of writing down bases in general. So let's say I have a basis which looks like V1 up to Vm, where by definition M is the dimension of the subspace V. And of course M is less than or equal to N. Okay, so the deal is this. Every basis has the same number of elements. That's called the dimension by way of review. So suppose we have a, a basis like that. So here's the crucial fact. Any x in the subspace can be written x in v can be written uniquely in only one way as a linear combination x is c1 v1 plus C2, V2, and so on, up to Cm, Vm. Okay, so there's only one way of writing it, and so these numbers are sort of special to x. The reason why it's unique is that if there were two ways of doing it, then these vectors wouldn't be linearly independent. 
And the reason why there's at least one way of doing it is because the span of these vectors is all of the subspace V. So you can get to anywhere in V by this sort of mechanism. Okay, so because these are sort of special numbers, and we discussed this last time, we're going to say that x is equal to the vector c1, c2, up to cm with this curly b, where b is this basis. I should put this up here. Basis b, oh, that's a pretty stupid b, equals those vectors. So I'm going to write this notation. This means that. Learn that. So this, when I write this, it means this. And it, an interesting thing about this is this is an n-dimensional vector. If you wrote it out in the standard coordinates, it's a, it's a, I'm assuming we're working in Rn. But V is only an m-dimensional subspace. So actually, this only has n coordinates. It's got fewer coordinates, or maybe the same, but certainly not more than this. So the reason you can get away with only m coordinates is because x has to live in the span of these. It has to live in the subspace. Of course, if the subspace V is the entire Rn, which it could be, we could have V equals Rn. That's a special case. So then m would equal n, because the dimension of Rn is n. Then you do have n coordinates there. So very, a lot of the time, the basis is a basis of the full Rn. But sometimes it's just the subspace in which case you have fewer coordinates. When I say just the subspace, I mean a proper subspace, not the whole thing. All right. So the crucial fact is this. There is a way of getting from here to here, and vice versa. Now, in order to motivate the way, all we have to do is define the matrix S whose columns are these basis vectors. The M, so it's an N by M matrix in general, N by M matrix, whose columns are the basis vectors. And so if this is true, then X is equal to S times this matrix xb. So I should say, OK, maybe this is not the clearest way to say it. Let, 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 let me change this. This is not exactly how the textbook does, does it. I will write it here. xb equals c1. Sorry about that. Up to CM means that's better. This. Okay. That's the notation. This notation, by the way, is specific to this book. I haven't seen it used elsewhere. There's different I mean there's no standard notation, but since we're all using the same book, we might as well say, okay, X B are the coordinates of x in B. So it's C1 up to Cm. And of course, that means the linear combination of the basis vectors V1 through Vm with coefficients C1 through Cm. All right, and now this is the critical equation using that notation. So what does this say? This says that if you know this vector, which is the coordinates of x with respect to the other basis, as in the, the basis B, then it's easy to find the regular old x. You just multiply by the matrix S. Unfortunately, it's not so easy to reverse the scenario. You have to start taking inverses. But in order to make life a little bit simpler, I'm going to discuss, say, the situation where V is all of Rn. So now, say V equals Rn, so B is has got n1 vectors 
uh, it got n vectors rather. So this is a basis of Rn. So there's no real subspace, we're just working in the whole space. So once again, we have x is equal to s times the b version of x. Again, s equals v1 up to vn. But now, by what I said right at the beginning, this is an invertible matrix. It's an n by n invertible matrix. Invertible matrices have to be square, of course. So this is invertible. OK, so this also means that if you want to find how x looks with respect to the new basis, you can multiply on the left by s inverse and have this equation. That's also valid in this case where we're dealing with v equals rn. OK, so those are very important. And I want you to try to remember it's easier to get from the basis coordinates to standard coordinates. You don't need an inverse. So it's sort of like translating from, say, French to English might be easier for English speakers than English to French. Standard, we're used to. If you know these weird coordinates, then it's easy to get back uh, to regular coordinates. Otherwise, you have to take an inverse to get back. OK, so let's look at a simple example of this. So EG, just working in R2. So if we have V1 equals 2, negative 1, V2 is negative 5, 1. So two questions. First, if x with respect to this basis, I'm going to say v equals v1, v2. I'm going to tell you that's a basis, although you could check it. If x with respect to b this is what? 1, 4. Find x in standard coordinates. They could just say find x. All right. How do we deal with that? Well, there's two ways. One is you could just understand this means that x is 1 lot of v1 plus 4 lots of v2. That's what this means. Okay, if you unwind these facts and say x with respect to b is 1, 4, that means x is 1 lot of the first vector plus 4 lots of the second vector. Okay, it's a linear combination of the basis vectors with coefficients 1, 4. So you could just compute this. 1 times v plus 4, v1 rather, plus 4 times v2. And if you work this out, you get 2 minus 20. And you get negative 1 plus 4, so minus 18, 3. Or you could use the formula. The formula says that x is Sxb, where S is the matrix whose columns are this. And let's just make sure we get the same thing. We have 2 minus 1, minus 5, 1 times this vector xb, which we know is 1, 4. So you have to do this multiplication. And of course, you get the same thing. You get 2 times 1 minus 5 times 4 is negative 18. And negative 1 times 1 plus 1 times 4 is 3. Of course, it's the same thing. Not only is it the same answer, it's the same computation. It's exactly the same computation by definition of matrix vector multiplication. We did exactly the same thing. 2 times 1 plus minus 5 times 4. 2 times 1 minus 5 times 4. It's just written in a different way. 
Okay, so transforming, transferring from XB to regular coordinates is easy, but the other way is a little trickier. So if Y is equal to 1, 2, what is YB? This is a little bit trickier. But again, there's two ways of doing it. Okay, so what is YB? Well, I can work, it, work over here a little bit more. Um, there's two ways of doing it. So basically, I'm trying to solve. So first method, you're trying to say, well, 1, 2 is equal to how many V1s plus how many V2s? So I want C1 V1, which I'll write as 2 plus C2, lots of the second vector, is equal to 1, 2. And as a matrix, well, I guess you could just try to solve this and fudge it. But as a matrix, you know, this is the same. There's only one method. <laughs> one method is going to come out the same thing. You get 2 minus 1, minus 5, 1, lots of C1, C2 equals 1, 2. Okay, maybe I will re reinstate this first method. I guess it is different. So as a matrix equation, that's mean, that means 2 minus 5 minus 1, 1, 1, 2. That's what I have to solve. That's what I have to solve. So you can do this by row reduction. Let's just see what we get. Uh, I guess I'll divide this by 2. And then add this new row to this row. So you get 0 minus 3 halves and 5 halves. So now we can adjust this to 1 minus 5 halves, a half, 0, multiply by negative 2 thirds, and you get 1, and you get minus 5 thirds. Is that what I actually got? I guess I never did it. OK. Uh, so this means immediately that C2 is minus 5 thirds. I guess you can finish the full thing. What the hey? Might as well sort of play pat by the thing. Multiply by 5 halves this and add. And you get 1, 0, a half plus 5 halves times minus 5 thirds. I'll work that out later. So what is this? Minus 25 sixths. So here's my scratch work. So that's negative 20 20 20 20 20 20 20 over 6, which is negative 11 over 6. Yuck. Did I make a mistake? Uh, 11 over 3. Oh, yes, sorry. <laughs> That's a pretty silly mistake. Thank you. Okay, so according to this method then, the coordinates are negative 11 thirds, negative 5 thirds. And we'll soon check my arithmetic because I will show you the second method. Instead of solving this particular method, you get the same equation as this, but we're going to use an inverse instead. Okay, so let's try this out. Second method is in general, we know that the B coordinates of Y are S inverse times the regular coordinates of Y. So this is this matrix 2 minus 1 minus 5, 1 inverse times the coordinates of y, which is 1, 2. And 2 by 2 is pretty easy. Uh, is that OK? I, I make frequent mistakes. 
The two by two is easy. The determinant is two minus five, which is negative a third. Switch the diagonal elements to get one, two, and put minus the off diagonal elements. So it's the inverse is like this. And then you just have to do the multiplication. You get negative a third. One times one plus two times five. Okay, so I say two methods. I mean, it's really just saying, well, how do you solve AX equals B for, this, for a given A and B where A is square? Well, if A is invertible, you can say X is A inverse B. But they're really the same thing. Okay, so before I move on, a question. Um, is S always invertible? The question is, is S always invertible? If it is a basis, which it, it needs to be for this to work, then yes. S is invertible. That's that very first fact I set up there. Any basis of the whole of Rn, the columns, the matrix from the columns is invertible. And in fact, if it's not invertible, it, was, it wasn't a basis. If the basis is not all of Rn, then you cannot do the second method because there's no inverse of a non-square matrix. But you could still solve AX equals B. So rather than the inverse, you, d you use method one. Except we wouldn't see a square matrix on the left. You'd be guaranteed to, f to have consistency, meaning a solution. And it would have to be a unique solution. If it wasn't consistent, then the vector you thought was in the subspace and tried to express in coordinates wasn't even in the subspace. There were no coordinates for it. Okay, so you can't use the second method with the inverse in the case of a non, well, if the subspace is not all of Rn. Any other questions before I move on? So that's the first little mini topic. Now, here's the deal. When you have a new coordinate system, sometimes it's nice to be able to express your linear transformation or a linear transformation with respect to the new coordinate system. Now, the full glory and generality of this takes a map from Rm to Rn, a linear transformation from Rm to Rn, and you can change the basis in Rm with one basis, and then that's sort of in the domain. And you can also change the basis in the range or the image that's the Rn basis with a different basis. But we're not going to do that. We're not going to do that. Even though we could, we won't. It's not in the book. We'll just deal with transformations T from Rn to Rn. So it's the, same, it's the same dimension. And I'm going to use the same basis in both. What are the coordinates of T? I'll tell you what that means. Well, OK. That's not the right way. What, what is T, matrix of T? That's what I want to say. What is the matrix of T, quote, with respect to the coordinates of a new basis or any old basis B? What does that mean? Well, the basic idea is this. Recall that if you knew what T of E1 is and T of En is, where these are the standard basis vectors, E1 equals 1, 0, 0, E2 equals 0, 1, 0, and so on. And the last one is En with the 1 all the way down at the bottom then the matrix of T, the standard old matrix of T, is just the matrix whose column vectors are what you get when you apply T to all these vectors E1 through EN. That's just standard stuff. Now, why does it work? 
Why does it work? Well, the idea is that, let's check this. Check to see what it means. What I'm saying is T of, say, some vector C1E1 plus C2E2 and so on. And remember, this just means C1 comma C2 comma, or at least the column vector. So by linear transformations, this is C1, well, by the fact that it's a linear transformation, you can bust out the, you can bust up the sum and you can pull out the coefficients because everything is linear. And if you think about it, in vector sort of land, well, this is the matrix that I've just described, this matrix, T E1, T E N, lots of the vector C1 up to C N. Okay, and of course, this vector is what you would normally think of as C1 up to Cn. Okay, what I want to do is I want to do this in parallel, but forget that these, forget that I know that E1 is 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, and E2 is 0, 1, 0, 0. Forget that. Just think of this as an arbitrary basis. So if I change this to a V1, V2, Vn, and I change this matrix accordingly, and I change this to instead the one in the new coordinates, then I get a completely consistent equation that makes sense with respect to another basis. So we better write it down so we can see what's going on and see what it means. So what I'm trying to say is, well, I will tell you what I'm trying to say when I have some space to write down. So with another basis, I'm going to try to do the same thing. So with another basis, which B, again, is V1 up to Vn, if I know that T of, say, V1, that's just some vector. That's some vector. What is it? Well, let's say it's B11, lots of V1, plus B12, lots of V2, and so on, up to B1n, lots of Vn. And how do I know that, I mean, I take TV1, I get some new vector. How do I know I can write it like this? Because the Vs are a basis. So on this level, I'm working with the basis vector, and on this side, I'm also working with the basis vector. So I do the same for TV2, but this time the coefficients I'm going to call, I need, I need a lot of numbers to, track, to, uh, to keep track of all these coefficients here. here. So these, this row all begins with a 2, and I keep going and I find what TVN is. And I express that BN2 all the way up to B, N, N, and so on. Okay, so if I know what T does to these N vectors, I know what it does to any vector, because any vector is itself a linear combination. Okay, so if this is true, then I'm going to say the matrix of T with respect to, I'm just writing WRT as a, with respect to the new basis B, which is, it is regular old B, which is these coefficients, B11, B12, up to B1N, B21, B22, up to B2N, and so on until you get up to the last row. Okay, so what this means is, or what this shows, this whole equation basically is trying to say 
that if you want to know what Tx is in the coordinates of B, this is equal to the matrix B times x in the coordinates of B. Compare this B here. That's a squirrely B. That no, the matrix is a regular old B. I, I really don't like how the book does that because it should be a different letter, but I should be consistent with the book. You can call a matrix anything you like, but this is a regular old B. I've taken ca uh, some care to distinguish between the squirrely B. If there's a hole here in the middle, it's a basis. Otherwise, it's a matrix. Okay. Okay. So it actually doesn't make sense if this is a squirrely B. This is a matrix times a vector. This is a vector. So contrast this to Tx equals Ax. This is T of x. Tx, T of x equals Ax. A is a different matrix from B. So you should learn this in a way. That's the definition, actually, of the B matrix of T. This is, this is the matrix matrix of T with respect to the basis B. Okay, so that, that's important. That's important. Okay. Now, let's, uh, let's just give a simple example first, and then we'll come back to it. So EG... If V1 and V2 are any old basis, is any basis of R2, I don't even know what these vectors are. They could be any, any two vectors that are not multiples of each other. If V1 and V2 is any basis of R2, and T of, say, C1, V1, plus C2, V2, is equal to C1 plus C2 V1 plus 2 C2 V2. Say I give you a linear transformation in terms of these vectors V1 and V2 defined by that equation. And the question is, what is the matrix of T with respect to the basis B, which is V1, V2. Now, the way I've said it, I haven't told you what V1 and V2 are. The interesting thing is, it's an easier question, I think, when I don't tell you what they are. Because if I tell you what they are, you would be tempted to write down all sorts of fancy machinery and changes of basis matrix. You don't need to know what they are. That's the whole point. I'll show you how you can pick up the coordinates of the matrix just by writing down what TV1 is. According to this, if I come back over here this and put mentally C1 equals 1 and C2 equals 0. So C1 equals 1, C2 equals 0. I find that TV1 is equal to V1. Whereas if I put C1 equals to 0 and C2 equals 1, I find what TV2 is. I find that it's V1 plus 2V2. Go back over here, see what happens when you just want to find out what happens to V2. C2 is 1. So you get one lot of V1 plus two lots of V2. And so according to what I've just said, so what I've just said, did I get these numbers wrong? <laughs> okay. So the matrix B, let's just check it. All I have to do is read off the columns here. And I get 1, 0, 1, 2. That's it.
Okay, so let's just do a reality check. We want to check this equation, t of x with respect to the space b is equal to this matrix b times x with respect to b. So pick any x. So you don't have to do this. I, I've done the problem. Hopefully I got it right. So I'm just bothered about one thing. <laughs> Uh, I think I've transposed it. Never mind. Never mind. This is what we'll soon see whether it's correct. Tx with respect to b has to be bx with respect to b. Okay, so let x be equal to c1v1 plus c2v2. That's a general sort of thing. So b times xb is equal to b times c1, c2. You see, the coordinates of x, by definition, with respect to b, are c1, c2. OK. So according to what I've said, if this is going to be correct, this is going to be 1, 0, 1, 2, c1, c2. So this is equal to c1, C1 plus 2C2. OK, so if this is correct, which it's not, then T of x, we already know what T of x with respect to b is. So T of x with respect to b is C1 plus C2 V1 plus 2c2 v2. Oops. So I screwed up. Let's try this. OK. So I have, if this is correct, and embarrassingly it is, it's good to get these mistakes out of the way early. OK, so let's see what we have. According to this, b, b, x, x, b, b, c, c, 1, c, 2, I now have my corrected matrix. And you get c1 plus c2, 2, c2, which is that. OK, so what did I do wrong? What I did wrong was I did not write this as columns. I, writ I wrote them as rows. So the moral of the story is everything is in terms of columns. And also, this is now not correct. <laughs> I have gotten these indices screwed up. So the best thing to do would be to write this as a column. So that's with respect to B. And that's with respect to B. And so I needed to write these as columns instead. So rather than memorize these matrices, let's just summarize what we've had. As you saw, I saw the writing on the wall quite early on. I knew I'd written that down wrong. <laughs> But I want to show you that actually you can check these things very simply by using the basic definitions and formulas. So let's consolidate and say the following. So what you want to do is find out what happens to TV1. And what you want to do is take the coordinates of this as a column vector, as the first column of B. And now repeat for TV2, etc. Well, this is the second column. OK. 
Okay, so anyway, going back over here, I see that I have TV1 is V1 plus zero V2. I take that vector one comma zero of coefficients and I shove that in the first column, one, zero. So it's sort of confusing because you have to take, it's not the way it's aligned on the, on, it, it's not aligned correctly. You have to transpose the whole thing. All right, sorry about that. I think everything else is correct. I think everything else is correct, but I'm, I'm unfortunately the numbering that I've ended up with, that I've chosen, is not consistent with the normal numbering that you have in a matrix. But I, I don't want to get too bogged down about that. I just want to understand the. It's important to understand the sort of methodology instead. So I mean, here it all is, right? This makes it very clear. coordinates C1, C2. And so if you multiply that by this matrix B, you get exactly the coordinates of V1 and V2 with, that Tx has by definition. I just copied what the Tx coordinates are. So it has to be the columns. Which of course is very much consistent with the fact that in the standard basis, you see what happens to TE1, and you stick that as the column, not the row. So not, not the rows. All right, we better move on. I've showed you, if you know T, if you know what T does explicitly in terms of the basis vectors, how to find the B matrix of T. But what if you don't know it explicitly, you actually only know what T is in regular form and you want to compute it? Or what if you want to transfer it from this version to the regular form? And there you need to use this notion of similar matrices. So let's suppose that we have the two things. We have T of X equals AX. That's the standard coordinates. Okay, but on the other hand, T also has a different matrix B with respect to the new coordinates. So Tx with respect to the coordinates B is equal to B times X with respect to B. So if you work in regular land, the matrix looks like A. But if you work in B land, the matrix looks like B. Well, fuzzy B, squirrely B land, the matrix looks like capital B. OK, so we have this. We know we can find a regular matrix. You just do it like this. And now, after a little bit of contorted fiddling around, we know how to find this matrix. So my question is, what's the relationship between these two? OK, well. We actually know the following. We know that S times the B coordinates of X is just regular X. And so somehow we're supposed to use this to work out this information, to relate these two together. Okay, so. Suppose I take S lots of this. S times the B coordinates of T of X. Squarely B. Well, by definition, this is just T of X. Because S is the way you get from B to regular. Now, T of X is equal to AX by definition. All right. Now, on the other hand, what I'm trying to say here is that T of X, by this equation, in the B coordinates, is capital B times X. So the left-hand side is equal to S times the matrix B, capital B, times 
times the x-coordinates with respect to b. On the other hand, I can reuse this equation and replace x back in the b land by sx. So this is a s, sorry, x with respect to b land. And so this says that if you take any x in b coordinates and multiply by b and then s, so sb, it's the same as first multiplying by s and then a, so as. So i.e. sb equals as. Or in other words, a is equal to either, if you, well, a is equal to s, b, s inverse, or b, if you prefer, is equal to s inverse a, s. They're all the same thing. Now, how do I know s has an inverse? Well, it's a square matrix whose columns are the basis vectors of b. And so it must have an inverse. Okay, so what I've done is prove something that you can just learn. I want to I'll state it in words. I want to state it in words and then show you this sort of example continued. All right, so this is a really useful fact to know. So, if T has matrix A with standard coordinates and matrix B with respect to the basis B, which is a new basis, And you can remember it in any way you like. It's probably easiest to remember. What's the, what's the easiest way to remember? Uh, let's do it like this. A is equal to SBS inverse. Where S is the most matrix columns. But do be aware that you can make b the subject of this, solve for b by multiplying on the left by s inverse and on the right by s. Okay? Now, when I look at this, there's actually a very good meaning for this. I want to show you why this works directly. I mean, I've proved it there, but here's how I like to think of it. I want to know what a does to x, but I only know what b does to x. Of course, b only makes sense in the new coordinates. So what I do to find this out, I start with x, and I need to find out its b coordinates. Well, as we saw earlier, the way to do that is to multiply by s inverse. That's the b coordinates of x. So this is now b coordinates. Now I can take that and multiply by b, so do the, do the transformation, and you get b s inverse x. And that's all in b coordinates still. This is now the squirrely b. And so you finally have to get back to standard which you, is easy, you just multiply by s. Okay, so first I multiply by s inverse to get over to b land, then I multiply by the matrix capital B to do the transformation in b land. I'm still in b land, so to get back I multiply by s. And that's exactly the same thing as just doing a as if I never changed coordinates. 
Okay, so it's very difficult to remember, I think, whether it's S, B, S inverse or S inverse A, S. I mean, here you, you start in, in B land and then you switch to standard and then do it and then back to B land. So it's the opposite direction, and it, it's sort of hard to remember which one is which. But I think if you can remember the standard sort of thing, that to get from B land to the standard, you multiply by S. So th that means if you've got AX, you first have to do the S inverse for, for that to make sense. What I'm trying to say is B cannot make sense unless it works in the B land, which was hard to find. If you remember that the B land was hard to find, then you know you need an inverse. Or you could just learn the formula. Okay, so any questions about the theory of that as I've just stated it? Yes? How do you know S will always be a square matrix? How do you know that S will always be a square matrix? Well, I'm working in Rn. I have a basis of Rn. Every basis of Rn has n vectors in it, by definition. Every basis has the same number. If you, I have any subspace, every basis has the same number of elements, which is the dimension of the subspace. And if the subspace is all of Rn, then it, every ba then it has n vectors in it. You're only working in all elements? For this part of the thing, yeah. I mean, I, I described earlier that you can actually do it from Rm to Rn, but that's what I'm on about. Okay. So, with a view to moving on, I'll just do one example. I'm going to continue the other example. We had. E.g., if V1 is equal to 1, 1, V2 is equal to minus 1, 1, and I know T is the same transformation as before, has matrix, which I hopefully have right, 1, 1, 0, 2, with respect to this basis B, which is V1, V2, what is standard matrix of A, of T? So, according to this, the standard matrix A that we're looking for is S, B, S inverse. So S is the matrix whose columns are the basis vectors. 1, 1, minus 1, 1. So that's V1, that's V2. Times B, which is the B matrix, times the inverse. So again, I screwed it up a little bit, but in the end, found that without knowing what V1 and V2 is. Just because of the definition of T was all on both sides of the equation in terms of V1 and V2. But then if you want to get serious and transform it back, you need to know what V1 and V2 are. You need to multiply by the inverse. So let's just do it because it's not very difficult. 1 minus 1, 1, 1. Actually, before I take the inverse, the, I'm going to find these two first, and then I'll take the inverse. So, I get this times this is 1, this times this is negative 1, well, like one, one, 1 minus 2 is negative 1, 1, 3. Now how do you find the inverse? Again, the determinant is 1 minus minus 1, which is a half. So I'll pull the half out here. That's from the inverse. Switch the diagonals around, that doesn't do anything and put minuses in front of the other ones. And then do this, and you'll get 1 times 1 plus 1 times 1, which is 2, 0, minus 2, and 4. And if I multiply that out, I get 1, 0, minus 1, 2. And that's the standard matrix. Now let's just do a reality check on this. Let's just do a check. We were supposed to have T of V1, which I've written up there, is V1. Right? That, that's part of the definition of T. 
So let's just check that this matrix sends V1 to V1. So we have 1, 0, minus 1, 2, lots of 1, 1. That's V1. And if you multiply it out, you get 1 plus 0, minus 1 plus 1, and you get 1, 1. We're also supposed to have T of V2 equals V1 plus 2 V2. Well, let's see what happens when we apply this matrix A in standard notation to V2, which is just minus 1, 1. We get 1 times minus 1 is minus 1. And here I've got 1 plus 2 is 3. So I get minus 1, 3. Well, what is that? Is that V1 plus 2 V2? Let's just check that. I don't know. Is it V1 plus 2 V2? 1 minus 2 is minus 1. 1 plus 2 is 3. Yes. So it works. It works. I've just checked it. You don't need to do the check. But like almost all of these questions, not the true false ones perhaps, but all the other questions can be just checked. All right, any other questions? Any questions about this? I have only one more little thing, well, one more thing to discuss from 3.4 before I move on to 5.1. All right, so make sure you know how to change bases. Okay, last point, but it's a pretty important one. Okay, so we've seen that we have an equation like A is S, B, S inverse. And if there is such an equation for an invertible S, so we go, so A and B are similar. If A equals S, B, S inverse, then A and B are similar. In fact, A is similar to B, but of course B is also similar to A. You have a different matrix. Instead of the matrix S, you use the matrix S inverse. Here, of course, S inverse inverse is just S. All right? So if A is similar to B, B is similar to A. Now, I want you to understand that this means Working the other way around, this means that A and B represent the same linear transformation. But with respect to different bases. So even though they look like different matrices, geometrically they're the same. Geometrically they must be the same, as it turns out. So that, that's sort of important. Now, in order to sort of motivate that, let's, let's consider a few of the standard types of transformations that we've seen. E.g., projection onto a plane. of R3. Okay, so we've seen that it's pretty tricky to find a projection matrix. But I'm going to say that every projection is similar to a specific matrix. 1, 1, 0. Every projection of R3 is similar to a diagonal matrix with two ones and a zero. Why? Well, to see why, pick any basis that looks like this. Well, let's first of all pick any vectors v1 and v2 in the domain. OK, now my question is, if the T is the projection onto the plane,
then what is T V1? Well, V1 lives in the plane. So it's already in the plane. There's nothing to project. It's just V1. And similarly, T of V2 equals V2. OK, well, that's only useful if V1 and V2 are linearly independent. So let's say pick linearly independent, i.e. actually V1 and V2 are basis, is a, a basis for the plane. There's a plane through the origin, a plane of R3 uh, through the origin. So it's a subspace. OK, we need a third basis vector. Let V3 be the cross product. Why not? We're working in three dimensions. So V3 is perpendicular to the plane. plane. So what do you get when you project a onto this plane a perpendicular? You get zero. Right, T V three is zero. Okay, so anything in the plane gets projected to itself, anything perpendicular to the plane gets projected to nothing projected to the zero vector. Okay, so that means that T of V one, one, zero with respect to the basis V one, V two, V three. Yeah, V1 and V2 do not have to be orthogonal. V3 has to be orthogonal to both V1 and V2. Yeah, if it doesn't, then that's not the right matrix for it. But I'm not saying that it's, simil it's only similar to this matrix. I'm just saying it is any projection is similar to this matrix. There's many other matrices that they are similar to. So if you have A similar to B, there are many other matrices that A and B are both similar to. Any change of coordinates will give you a different matrix which it's similar to in general. Okay, so T looks like this with respect to V1, V2, and V3. Okay? So that means that the projection is similar to this. So the regular old projection matrix, so if T of X equals PX for this projection matrix, standard projection, which we did before the, the quiz actually, then P is similar to 1, 1, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. And what would the S be that changes this matrix B into this matrix P? What's the S? S is equal to V1, V2, V3. So P is equal to S, 1, 1, 0, all zeros here, S inverse for that particular S. So it's another way of computing projection matrices. Probably, possibly an easier one, although there you have to take a three-dimensional three inverse. You don't have to take dot products, but uh, it gives you a different perspective on the, on the problem. You just have to find two vectors in the plane take their cross product, find the inverse of that matrix, and multiply all this out. Okay, Maybe it's easier to do the method we did before the quiz. All right. So that's sort of important. How about a reflection in the plane? How about a reflection in the plane? It doesn't matter what the plane is, it's also similar to a very simple matrix. Every reflection in a plane of R3 
is similar less, to 1, 1, minus 1. The argument's almost the same. This time, t of v1 is v1 as before. We're reflecting in this plane v1, v2, v3 is up here. V1 and V2 are on the surface of the mirror. So when you reflect them, they go to themselves. Whereas V3 is sticking out, so it's going to get reflected into minus V3. Everything is centered at zero. So T of V3 equals minus V3. So by the same argument, the matrix of T with respect to these vectors, V1, V2, V3, is 1, 1, minus 1. And therefore, the original matrix of T, the standard coordinate matrix of T, is similar to this. Okay? Bless you. All right, any questions about projections or reflections? Yes? You do well on the midterm. When do you use this? Uh, this is the question. When do you use this? So one way you could use it is to find a reflection matrix, as I said. Okay, here I gave the example for a projection matrix. But you could also use this to find a reflection matrix. But I have to admit, it's still easier to do it the way that we did before the quiz. On the other hand, I have seen true-false questions, which said specifically, let P be a projection you know, of a plane. Then P is similar to this. And if you don't know it, then you're in some trouble. So what I'm saying is you can use this to compute them. I've given you a formula for computing a projection matrix. There it is. Pick, okay, and the same thing. If you change this bottom 0 to a minus 1, then you can compute the reflection matrix as well. Okay, so. In a few minutes, I'll start chapter 5, and one of the things we'll see is a more general thing where instead of working with a plane in R3, we work with an m-dimensional subspace of Rn, and then define projections and reflections. And there, it's really helpful to understand. Any other questions about this? Just have a couple other things to say about uh, similar matrices. So um, it goes without saying, maybe it doesn't go without saying, this is actually an exercise in the book. If A is similar to B, then they have the same rank. They have the same rank. Okay, it's actually quite difficult to prove. Question first. Ah, we'll come to that. That's Graham Schmidt comes into it. Okay, so I won't answer the question yet, but very soon. I won't even repeat the question for the video because I'm going to answer it soon. Okay, so in this thing, if A is similar to B, they have the same rank. Now, there's a, a difficult proof of it in the book, but there's actually a really simple proof. A and B G represent the same linear transformation, T. And so the rank of both is the same as the dimension of the image of T. Case closed. It's the same. That's my favorite proof of it. But anyway, most likely this is a true false type of question. They also have the same nullity, which of course is the dimension of the kernel. Again, you can prove that. But again, it's the same linear transformation, so there's the same there's the same geometrical object, which is the kernel. They look different with respect to different coordinates, but they must have the same dimension because it's the same physical space or geometrical space. A question. Can you repeat what you said what your proof is? Well, my proof is this. There's some G, okay, suppose A is the standard basis. Okay, so think of it as a linear transformation. So the, the, the rank, you look at the image of A. So it's a subspace of Rn, say. Okay, now, B is the same linear transformation, but with respect to a different basis. But the image is still geometrically the same subspace. 
It's just described by different coordinates, but it must have the same dimension. Therefore, the rank is the same. Now, I don't want you to think that the image of A is the same as the image of B. Not true that the image of A as a matrix equals the image of B, or even that the kernel of A equals the kernel of B. I'm not saying that. I'm saying that they have the same dimension. The images have the same dimension. Yes, the images have the same dimension because they are physically the same space. You're just turning your head around and giving them different coordinates. Rank but that's it. The, the rank is the dimension of the image. Right? By definition, the image of A is the image of T, where T is the linear transformation. So they, they're both like the children or the, the world view of the same geometrical object. Okay, so in the case of, say, the reflection, the natural coordinates to use is these. Okay, so this is the same. Of course, if you relabel your axis as V1, V2, V3, so that everything is tilted around, then, hey, that's just the standard reflection that sends the first vector to itself, the second vector, and it flips around the z-axis. But it's the same transformation, even though the matrix looks completely different. So geometrically speaking, the dimensions must be the same, even though the actual vectors or coordinates that you write are not the same. Okay? Uh, a couple of other things. What's similar to the identity? Just the identity. Look, if A is similar A equals S I N S inverse. But see the identity does nothing. So it commutes with everything, or rather S times the identity is just itself. So it's S S inverse, but S times S inverse is the identity. So if A is similar to the identity, then A equals the identity. Identity only similar to itself. And of course, the same for any multiple of the identity, which is like a scaling transformation. They're only similar to itself, nothing else. OK, so identity is a bit of a freak from most of the matrices. All right, what else? One other thing. I have seen this question asked, although I think it's a little unfair. I've seen it asked in a recent midterm. So maybe this is not in the course. But sometimes it's possible to take an extremely large power. Suppose you want to take A to the power 123. And that could be really difficult. If it's the case that a is S, B, S inverse, where B is diagonal. I mean, it looks only like a diagonal entry, so all of the other entries are 0. B1, B2, up to Bn, and all of these are 0. Yeah, the Bs could be 0, they could be negative. I just mean it's a diagonal matrix. Okay, diagonal means only diagonal entries are non-zero, but some of the diagonal entries, or all of them, could be zero. Okay, if that's the case, it is worth knowing the following. A to the 123 is equal to S, B to the 123, S inverse. So there's two ways of seeing that. A to the 123 means you do the transformation 123 times. You take it, you find what you get, repeat, take that and hit T, 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 T. Okay, so it's kind of nasty. But so S inverse transfers you first to the new coordinates, then you can do the B matrix 123 times, and then finally transfer to S. Now, if you don't believe it, then it's worth seeing this equation written down once. Man, time is flying. Time is bloody flying. It's ridiculously bloodily flying. I don't quite know what to do. 
other than keep going. Okay, it's worth seeing this once. A squared equals A times A, which is equal to S, B, S inverse. S, B, S inverse. And the middle S's cancel out, and you get S, B squared, S inverse. And if you repeat this over and over again, you'll find that every pair of adjacent S inverse S's just cancel out. And so continue along and you'll get A to the 123 equals S, B to the 123, S inverse, as I said. Now the beauty is that it's easy to compute the 123rd power of B. This is easy because B is diagonal. Anyway, I don't think that this is formally examinable because it comes in the textbook after the, after 5.2. It's somewhere later on. So we, I don't know. I found it on a previous midterm. There was one question like this. We can go over it. It's probably they did the course in a separate order. I'm just mentioning in the context of similar matrices, I doubt that that sort of question would come up, but you should be aware that powers of A have a nice relationship with powers of B. Okay, there it is. We can go over questions based on this later in the Q&A thing, but just... just uh, why is it easy to take the power of the diagonal matrix? Why is it easy to take the power of the diagonal matrix? Because when you square it, you just get the square of all the elements. When you cube it, you get the cube, etc. You can try that for yourself, but you'll see that when you multiply it by itself, it's only B1 and B1 interact and the same. So that's post midterm stuff, but you could already see that. Okay, that's the end of 3.4 that was supposed to take uh, 45 minutes, but has taken considerably longer than that. For a bit of right, light relief, we now move on to orthogonal vectors. Okay, so I just want to remind you orthogonal means v dot w equals zero. They're perpendicular. The dot product is zero. Okay. So, whereas unit means that the length of v is one. So we're going to say that u1 up to um are orthonormal If u i dot u j, so you take any two of these, maybe even the same two, this is supposed to be equal to 1 if i equals j and 0 if i is not equal to j. And of course, what does u i dot u i equal 1 mean? This means that the length of ui squared is 1. Because the length of ui squared is ui dot ui, by definition. So ui itself equals 1. That means that they're all unit vectors, all length 1. All unit vectors perpendicular to each other. Okay, so they're not just any old vectors. They all have length one, and they're all perpendicular to every single other one of them. They must be linearly independent. They must be linearly independent. And if you had to prove that, what you would do to prove that a collection of vectors is linearly independent, you take a linear combination of them and set that equal to the zero vector. This is true for any problem that says show that they're linearly independent. There's only two ways of doing it. One is like this, and the other is to find the kernel. But the, my favorite way is say, okay, solve that, and what do you want to show? You want to show that all these numbers, C1 up to Cm, are zero. So you need to show, want to show that C1 equals C2 equals Cm equals zero. Okay. That's what we like to show. Okay, so how do we show it? Well, the only thing we know is that these are orthonormal. So take this equation, dot both sides by ui. So dot by ui on the left and the right. 
and you will get C1 U1 dot UI plus and so on up to CM UM dot UI equals zero dot UI, which of course the dot product of the zero vector with any vector is zero, the number zero. So I've taken care to put a zero with an arrow above as opposed to just the number zero. Now what is u1 dot ui? Well, if one is not equal to i, then this is zero. Otherwise it's one. So actually all of these are zero. That's zero, that's zero. These are all zero except for the i1. So these are all zero except one of them is going to exactly match and we'll get ci ui dot ui is zero. But ui dot ui is one. So this says ci equals zero. Because ui dot ui is one. Well, that's true for any i. So repeat for all i. Nice little proof, huh? They're all zero, one at a time. You just dot by u1, then u2, then u3, then u4, up to um. And each time you learn a different one of these is zero. So these must all be zero. If and therefore the only solution to this is trivial, therefore orthonormal vectors are linearly independent. That's how these proofs go. I doubt that you'd have to recover that, but anything's possible. Now, given this, this means that any n orthonormal vectors in Rn form a basis. You don't have to check anything else other than they're orthonormal because you automatically know by that little proof there that they're in linearly independent and because there are n of them, any n linearly independent vectors in Rn form a basis. Okay, It's important to know any n False? True. That's true. Okay, so in particular, if they're orthonormal, they're linear independent, so they form a basis. Now, let's talk about projections. Come back to projections in general. So, if V is any subspace, of Rn, it turns out, and we'll see a formula for it, you can write any x in Rn as an x parallel plus an x perpendicular. So that's a decomposition of x into two pieces. And the important thing about this is that x parallel is actually in the subspace V. And x perp is orthogonal to everything in V. Okay, so not only are these two things perpendicular to each other, that's true, they're perpendicular to each other, but this thing is perpendicular to everything in V. So here's the intuition. I have some vector, x. I want to write x as something in V plus something orthogonal to the entire subspace. So this is x parallel, and this is x perp, and that's a right angle there. So x perp is sticking out. Now this is such an important notion that a vector should be orthogonal just to, to the entire subspace that we define v perp which is the set of all such vectors. So it's the set 
of all x in Rn such so that x is orthogonal to every vector in V. Or more compactly, i.e. it equals the set of all x's so that x dot little v equals 0 for every v in the subspace. So geometrically, it's a perpendicular to the subspace. All right, now, it turns out that this is a subspace. V perp is a subspace. And I'll, see, I'll show you why in a sec. V perp is a subspace. Given any, sub, given any uh, subspace V. And what's more, we have a few facts that you should learn or understand why at least. So first, well, what's the first one I want to say? Okay, first is that the only thing in both V and V perp is the zero vector. The intersection is the zero vector. After all, everything in here is perpendicular to everything in there. So if something's in both, it has to be perpendicular to itself. The only vector that's perpendicular to itself is zero. Okay, so that's the first fact. The second fact is that the perp of the perp is really a nasty person. No, the perp of the perp is just V itself. And that has to be proved. I'm not going to prove it. But it makes sense geometrically. It makes sense geometrically. I mean, here's V. V perp in this picture is just one vector here, one dimensional. But what are all the vectors perpendicular to this? Oh, it's the original plane. So it works both ways. And the third fact, which I'm going to explain in a few seconds, is this. The dimension of V plus the dimension of V perp is equal to N, because we're working in Rn. Everything's in Rn. So in this example, we're in three dimensions. V has two dimensions. The perp has one dimension. One plus two equals three. Two plus one equals three. So why should that be true? Well, in order to see why, we need to look at orthogonal projections. Okay. So here is the deal with orthogonal projections. We're going to say, I've given you this result here, that you can decompose x in this way. And not only can you do this, you can do it uniquely. And that's a theorem from the book, which I'm not going to prove. It's a theorem from the book. Now, on the other hand, you do have to understand what x parallel is. This is indeed the projection of x onto v. So before we saw projections onto lines and projections onto planes, well, that's a special case of the projection onto an arbitrary subspace. And the definition of this, well, there's a, that's the definition, I guess, but we ought to be able to compute it. First, let's just point out that x perp is by definition x minus the projection onto v. After all, x perp plus x parallel has to equal x. Okay, so here is a beautiful formula that you ought to know. If we are working with some orthonormal basis, not just any old basis, if that is an orthonormal basis, Let's go only up to M of V, which is M dimensional. So I now want to pick M vectors in V, which are orthonormal and form a basis. Okay, so then it's not just any old basis, they're actually at right angles to each other. If that's true, 
then there's a nice formula for the projection, which you just need to learn. It is u1, well, do I want to write u1 dot x or x dot u1? I guess u1 dot x. It's the same thing, but u1 dot x, lots of u1. Up to u dot x, lots of u m. That's completely consistent with the formulas that we've looked at before. You might remember the formula for projection onto a line was just this first term. Sometimes you write this over u1 dot u1, but that's 1 because it's a unit vector. So there you have it. Beautiful. In some sense, this vector makes, uh, this equation makes a lot of sense geometrically. What it's saying is this is true even without a projection. If you just look at what is the coordinate of a vector with respect to the first vector? Well, you just dot it with the first vector. So if this is just E1 and you dot it with X, you just get the first coordinate of X. And then you shove that in the first position. So any vector actually can be written in this form if you go all the way up to n, is what I'm trying to say. Anyway, that's something to learn, and we'll see how to do problems with that. Now, I guess what I want to say then, I'll, I'll say what I was just saying in words, I'll write it down. If u1 up to un is a basis for all of Rn, so now we have n of them, then x itself is equal to u1 dot x all the way up to un dot x, un. Why do you not need a projection? Well, if v, this subspace, is the entire Rn, then the projection is just the identity. So this equals the projection of x onto all of Rn. What's the projection of a vector in a plane onto the plane? It's just the same vector. So what's the projection of Rn of an n-dimensional vector? It's itself. So this formula here gives you a general sort of decomposition of x in terms of the use. So to find the coordinates of a vector x in an arbitrary basis we saw was nasty. We have to take an inverse. But somehow in an orthonormal basis is very simple. You just take the dot products and find all these quantities. And that's not so hard to do at all. All right. Let me whip through the rest of 5.1 so I can get onto the real meat in 5.2 which is the Graham Schmidt stuff. Which I, I may well skip the QR stuff just to save some time and do that later if anyone wants to see it. I've been told, maybe someone else can confirm this, about the QR. Some, some of the sections have actually said, oh, there's not going to be any QR on the exam. Does anyone concur with that? OK, well, if someone said that, then you should all know that, right? Unless it's false. And if it's false, you can all come and howl after me. So I give you the information that some sections were told QR factorization specifically is not on the exam. And that's because they didn't do it in class. So I think it's pretty unfair to be examined about something you don't do in class. So I'm not going to do it unless we have time much later. I'm sorry? Wait. Is that confirmed? Well, no one's seen the exam, so we can't specifically confirm it. But who in this class did not do QR factorization in class? OK, so if it's on the exam, all these people have a lot of reason to be able to complain. OK, so I think it's, it's either confirmed or there's going to be an uproar. OK, so I'm going to take that as a sign that I shouldn't spend time on it tonight. OK, 
please. Before I go on, I want to point out one thing. Let's look at this. This fact up here. There it is. Okay, please. I want you I want to ask you this. If you consider this linear transformation, T of X equals the projection. What is the image of T? Can anyone tell me? It's actually V. See, everything in V already gets sent to itself, and everything not in V gets projected into something V. So the image is V. What is the kernel of the projection? What, what projects to zero? It's the stuff that's perpendicular to V that gets swooshed down to zero. So actually, V perp is the kernel of T. So this is the rank nullity theorem for that particular projection. The rank of the projection, which is this dimension, plus the nullity is n, which is the dimension of the space. Now, I know normally you learn it as m because you're working with an rm to rn or an n by m matrix. But here, n equals m, so that's fair game. Is the letter n. All right. So the only stuff that I have left to do is just a few little inequalities that uh, don't seem to come up very much, but just let me state them. They're going to be more important after the midterm, but technically this is examinable. I, I really just can't think of any midterm questions that actually had it, but here's just a few facts that I'm not going to prove. Okay, so we have a Pythagoras' theorem. Pyth says that the length of x plus y is squared is equal to the length of x squared plus the length of y squared if and only if x is perpendicular to y. So x dot y equals 0. And geometrically, that makes sense. x is in v. Y is in V perp. Let's stick it at the bottom there. X plus Y is the hypotenuse of a right angle triangle only if X and Y are perpendicular and the triangle is in fact right angled. Also, a general fact is that the length of the projection is less than or equal to the original length. That's true for any projection. It also makes some sort of sense. It comes directly from Pythagoras' theorem. Here's a vector. Its projection is only part of it. Its perp is another part of it. And because they're right angled, the longest one must be the hypotenuse. So this is the hypotenuse, and this is the adjacent, or the opposite, depending on your point of view. But the hypotenuse is longest. So this is, that's just that equation. And then finally, you have this beautiful Cauchy-Schwarz inequality, which is actually extremely useful all throughout math in many unforeseen ways. Maybe there's a T in this. Is that the dot product, and you can even take an absolute value if you like, is less than the length. I'd love to prove that, but I don't have time. Uh, you get equality here. This is an equal sign if and only if x is a multiple of y. If they're in the same direction, then these two quantities are actually equal. Anyway, as I said, learn them try to understand why by all means, but haven't seen any questions about them. There's also some stuff about statistical thickness I'm going to skip so that I can move on to 5.2 and talk about Graham Schmidt. That's really the only thing that's left since I'm skipping uh, the QR factorization for the moment. Question first. Did I say something about the orthogonal complement? I did. 
but I did not refer to it by name. And you are quite right. If V is a subspace, V perp is the orthogonal complement of V. It's the same thing. I just I should have written the words or said the words orthogonal complement, but they slipped my tongue. So I certainly did. Any other questions before I move on? Okay, so Graham Schmidt is an algorithm. Here's what it does. You start with a basis for a subspace. For a subspace V of Rn. Now, this also works on the complete set. So if V equals all of Rn, and you have n of them, of course, you call up n with the space for the whole of Rn. So the idea is to f find an orthonormal basis, an orthonormal basis of V. That's, that's what we want to do. And it's an algorithm, and you need to know how to do it. So you need to practice doing it. But in addition to this, it would be a good idea to understand why it works, just in case you need to check the geometry for any reason. I can imagine true-false problems, although I haven't seen them, which sort of tests your knowledge of this. So here's the idea. The first step is easy. You have V1. That's a... That's a basis, actually, of just a one-dimensional subspace spanned by itself. But it's not orthonormal. So you can actually find u1 is v1 divided by its length. So that makes it unit. We don't have to worry about orthonormal. We only are worried about the, the ortho part. Of it, or, I don't know what that means. We're only worried about the, the unit part of it. So. Basically, this makes it into a unit vector. So if there's only one vector, you're done. By the way, how do you know this is not zero? Well, if the denominator was zero, then the vector would be zero, and it wouldn't really be a basis. Basis vectors can't be zero. OK, so now, you have v2 as well. So you introduce v2 in the mix. OK, so here's v1, which is the same as u1. And here you have a v2. Okay, so you need to see what new But actually, you, that doesn't give you anything else. What you really want is V2 perp. That will be orthogonal to U1. So you want V2 perp. That's the next one that we want. Now, what is that? That's v2 minus the projection, v2 parallel. But by the formula for projection, it's v2 minus u1 dot v2 u1. That's the projection onto just u1 by the formula that I wrote before. OK, so you now have one vector u1, which is unit, and you have another vector v2, which is not unit, but at least it's orthogonal to u1. And together, these two span the same as the original. It's the same plane. So the only thing you have to do is let u2 be the normal version of v2. So you unitize it. Again, how do you know that's not zero? Well, if it is zero, then v2 perp is zero. And if v2 perp is zero, that means that v2 equals its parallel, which means v2 is in the same direction as u1 and v1, which means it wasn't a basis after all, because they're linearly dependent. They're, they're multiples of each other. Anyway, one more step, and then the generality keeps going. So to get v3, now we already have a plane. We have a u1 and we have a u2 
and they're orthogonal to each other and normal. And now we have some other vector v3 up here. Again, we could project it down here and get v3 parallel. And when I say parallel, I now mean with respect to the u1 and u2 plane. So it's all the previous stuff. I ignore all the rest of them, but I kind of keep track of what I already have. Now, of course, the u1 and u2 is the same plane as, as the v1 and v2, but we forget about them. We've replaced them already with better improved models, u1 and u2. But now we have to deal with v3. So I, I project it, and then I take the perp, and that's going to be orthogonal to both u1 and u2. And it's almost going to be the correct one. Almost because it's not unit, but we'll fix that up at the end. So v3 is v3 minus v3 perp, which is v3 minus the projection. And now the projection, you have to take u1 dot v3, lots of u1, minus u2 dot v3, lots of u2. And together, this is minus the projection. This is minus the projection onto span u1, u2. And then the only other thing you have to do is make it unit. So you take this new vector you found and you divide by its length. And so after three steps, we have three unit vectors which are orthonormal, and their span is the three-dimensional space already spanned by v1, v2, v3. And then you just keep on going. So of course, when you remember this formula, maybe you don't need to remember all these perps. You, you could just learn it as an algorithm. So, I, I mean, I didn't actually remember the formula. I just, I know what the projection is. So I just wrote it down from, like, understanding it. But, nevertheless, on an exam, such as you have to do tomorrow, maybe it makes sense to just learn the guts of the formula that you have u1 is v1. I'll just rewrite what you absolutely need to know. So let's just say v1 start, and then compute v2 perp, which is v2 minus u1. Oh, let's just do this over here. u1 dot v2 v2, and then u2 is v2 perp over v2 perp's length. Then you compute v3, u1 dot v3, yeah, it's times u1, thank you. This is also u1, u2. 2 dot v3, v3, and then u3 is v3 perp over the length of v3 perp, and so on. So you should be aware that every step will have one more of these terms. Oh, hell, this is u2 again. Okay, that's better. Every step has exactly one more. Now, little philosophical question. Why do we not have a perp here? <laughs> well, you sort of do. This, this perp is perpendicular to all the vectors before. So it's, the, it's the projection, well, it's v2 minus the projection onto v1. Well, on the zeroth step, there's nothing. So v1 is sort of already orthogonal to the zero subspace. So v1 equals v1 perp, but that's just silly. Just learn it. the first step is a little bit different. For all the other steps, you, you don't have to do anything with v1 to start. v2, you have to subtract one term. 
from what you've already computed and then renormalize. V3, you have to subtract two terms and then renormalize and so on. All right. So, okay, I'm going to do an example, but a question. Okay, if suppose V3 is already orthogonal to V1 and V2. Okay, so you can save some time. So you found U1, you found U2. You can save some time by just realizing that V3 is the same as V3 perp. If you can already see its orthogonals, you know, to the first two vectors, then this will, you, can, you don't even need to compute V3 perp. You just use V3. Why will that work? Well, you are saying that V3 is orthogonal to both V1 and V2, which means it's orthogonal to everything in the subspace, the two-dimensional subspace, spanned by V1 and V2. But U1, U2 is also a basis. It's a different basis. So that means that U1.V3 and U2.V3 will both be zero. So what, what, if V3 is orthogonal to the first two, it'll also be orthogonal to U1 and U2. And so it will come out as zero. But you could save some time of the computation by just throwing it in there. Oh yeah, if it's already a unit vector, then you, again, you divide by one. So this method works no matter what, but you can of course save time if you happen to notice that some of them are already orthogonal or some of them are already unit, sure. You then the formulas will always work, but some of them will just be zero. Some of the terms will be zero or one. Okay, another question. Sorry, the question is if you have a three-dimensional basis, orthonormal. There are some questions that involve three vectors in R4, but they are not an orthonormal basis of all of R4. They are an orthonormal basis of a subspace, a three-dimensional subspace of R4. They use Gram-Schmidt, and you get an you get I mean, well, have any basis, you use Gram-Schmidt, you get an orthonormal basis of that three-dimensional subspace. And then often the question is to find a fourth vector, right? But to do that, you're not using Gram-Schmidt. You need to find a vector in the kernel. And I'll talk a few seconds about that. That's actually only one other thing that I, now that I see it, I forgot to mention it in 5.1. So um, let's see, what, where did my cell phone go? I've lost the time. Here it is. I promised to finish at 10.2. Oh, it's only 9.30. Hallelujah. Something's actually going to time. All right, well, I have time to do these two things. And then I guess at 10, you know, we'll take a, a bit of a break so you can get some food. And then at 10 o'clock, my friends, I'm going to do the one hour summary. And then at 11 o'clock, it's going to be Q&A. And we'll just keep going until, you know, we've answered all the questions. Sorry, it'll be late, but there you go. Now, I think I should do an example. I think I should do an example of Graham Schmidt. I was going to do three vectors. OK, maybe I'll still do three vectors. What the hell? Here's the example. V1 equals 1, 1, 1, 1. V2, 1, 0, 0, 1. And V3 equals 0, 2, 1, minus 1. OK, so this is exactly the situation that you just described in your question. It's three dimensional, there's three vectors in R4. So it's not the whole of R4. It's a subspace, they span a subspace. Hopefully they're basis vectors. We'll soon find out. If they're not, then the Gram-Schmidt's going to give us some zeros on the denominator, and we'll know it. OK, but what we're going to do is uh, compute u1. So I'll set this all up. v1 is 1, 1, 1, 1. And all the way over here, I'll write u1 is equal to 1, 1, 1, 1 over its length. And the length is. 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared plus 1 squared, which is 4. It's root 4, which is 2. So this is the vector a half, a half, a half, a half. OK, so that was fairly easy. Now, how about v2 perp? Well, according to the formula, this is v2 minus the projection onto the first vector. So it's u1 dot v2 u1. See how much easier it is when you realize that it's v2 minus the projection. Instead of just memorizing some random formula, if you know what a projection is, then you, you, it makes sense to write this down. So let's actually compute this. 
V2 is 1001 minus the dot product. Uh, U1 is a half, a half, a half, a half, dot 1001, and that many, a half, a half, a half, a half. And if we compute this, what do you get? Well, this dot product is just one. It's a half plus a half. So this is, I can actually squish this over here. It works out to be one minus a half is a half. Zero is minus a half. Zero minus a half is minus a half. And one half. So U2 is the length, is this vector one half minus a half, minus a half, a half over its length. Well, the length is not so bad. It's a quarter plus a quarter plus a quarter plus a quarter, which is one squared of one is one. Somehow there's something very nice about four halves or minus a halves. So length is one. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Is this orthogonal to this? Yes, if you take the dot product, you get zero. Other reality check. Does U2 and U1 together give you V1 and V2 in the span? Well, twice U1 is V1, okay, no big deal. But uh, how do you get V2 from U1 and U2? You can sort of just see it. If you take U1 and U2 and you take a linear combination, how do you get back V2? Yeah, you just add them. It's one lots of U1 plus one lot of U2. Okay, that's not always easy to see, of course, in your head, but in this case, it is. So I have some confidence that it works. Anyway, let's just find V3 perp is V3 minus U1 dot V3 U1 minus U2 dot V3 U2. Okay, so another memory, another little memory aid. Notice that the only V vector that appears is V3. We've already used up V1, V2. I said forget about them. We're on to use. We've replaced V1 and V2 by U1 and U2. We have no more need for them. But V3, of course, we're working on. By the time we're done with this, we'll have no more need for V3. But we'll be done. OK, so V3 is 0, 2, 1, minus 1. And I have to subtract the dot product of U1, which is a half, a half, a half, a half, with this new vector 0, 2, 1, minus 1. And it's that many lots of a half, a half, a half, a half. And then unfortunately I have one more term. I have to take this U2, which I found just recently, a half minus a half minus a half, a half, and dot it with the same vector, 0, 2, 1, minus 1, and work out how many lots of 1 half minus a half minus a half, 1 half there is. What a mess. OK, but nevertheless, we can do it. I'm just going to write out this vector. Now let's compute this dot product. You get 2 times a half is 1. 1 times a half gives us an extra half, but then we subtract it away again. So I just get 1 again. And then what about this vector? We Uh, yeah, this is a 1, sorry. It matches that. That could have been a stray chalk mark, but anyway. Thank yeah. you. This is a half, minus a half, minus a half, a half, which is this vector there. Okay, anyway, so the dot product here is 0, minus 1, minus a half, minus a half. So what is that? Minus 2. So this dot product is minus 2. If you were doing the QR factorization, by the way, you'd have to keep track of these dot products. And they just form the R matrix. It's really not that bad. But I, don't have, I decided I don't have time to do it. So I, I get minus 2 here. So minus 2 times, let's not worry about this minus first. Minus 2 times a half is minus 1. And then I get 1, 1, minus 1. And if I work this out, the vector is, drum roll, minus a half plus 1 is a half. 2 minus a half minus 1 is a half. 1 minus a half minus 1 is minus a half. 
minus 1 minus a half plus 1 is minus a half. Ta-da! And finally, u3 is this vector that we just found, which is a half, a half, minus a half, minus a half, divided by its length, which of course is 1. So the vector is a half, a half, minus a half, minus a half. Reality check, well, it's starting to get more difficult. This is clearly perpendicular to the original one. It's also perpendicular to this one. If you take the dot product and you'll, you'll see it comes out to zero. Uh, it's not anywhere near obvious how you get V3 out of it anymore, but you could, you could, if you tried, generate it from it. Okay, so when I say it's not obvious, actually these formulas will tell you how to do it. If you reverse engineer it, this is V3 perp, this is V3, we can write this and this in terms of this matrix and it, it will come out. And the coefficients that you'll need is something like 1 and minus 2 and, and 1, something like that. Anyway, there is the answer. Those three columns at the right are three orthonormal vectors which span the original subspace. Okay, now in order to finish off this topic, and therefore finish or get up to a break. I need to tell you one more thing that I seem to have forgotten that you nicely reminded me about and that fits perfectly into this problem here. So I talked about orthogonal complements, but I actually didn't show you how to find them in a way. So let's say that V is the span of V1 up to Vm, how do you find V perp? That's what your question comes down to. Okay. So you want to find, you want x dot every one of these to be zero. You want x dot V1 to be zero. You want x dot V2 to be zero and so on. And if you think about it, what this means is you need to take a strange matrix. Take a matrix with rows. As these vectors, as the basis vectors. That's not something we've done. I tried to do it earlier, of course, made a mistake. So what I want to do, I want to think of these vectors as row vectors and write it like this, V1, V2, and so on, down to Vm. So this is actually a little bit odd. It's an M by N matrix, not an N by M. We've normally been doing like that. So this is a subspace, I should say subspace of Rn. And let's say these are a basis, what the hell? Even if it's not a basis, it'll work. But let's say this is a basis. So I take this matrix and... But I will just remind you that the way you compute this is you dot this with this and put that in the first column or the first entry. So v1.x, and then you dot v2 with x, and you get v2.x, and so on until the last row is vm.x. And these are all supposed to be 0. So i.e., x is in the kernel. X is in the kernel because of, of this matrix. Right? And vice versa. Anything that's in the kernel will be perpendicular to all of these row vectors, and therefore it's in the perp. So, in other words, you just have to find the kernel of a specific matrix. So, V perp is the kernel. of the matrix whose 
rows are a basis of V. That's the fact. Well worth knowing. I've seen that examined many times. So in our particular question, suppose we come back and I give you these three vectors V, 1, V2, V3. And I say, consider their span. How much longer have I got? Oh, four, four or five minutes. Well, it's only 9.41. Is that the heat? OK, anyway. Uh, Right, so I now ask you a question. And once we finish that, we'll take a long break and start again at 10. Okay, <coughs> consider these three vectors up here, V1, V2, V3. They span a three-dimensional subspace of R4. The question is, find a four-dimensional orthonormal basis of R4. So we want an orthonormal basis, U1, U2, U3, U4. Such that span of u1, u2, u3 equals v, where v is the span of v1, v2, and v3. That's the question. So we've actually done most of it already. We found u1, u2, and u3. The Graham Schmidt said, oh, you just start with V1, V2, V3, and you apply that, you get U1, U2, U3. They have the same span as the original first three. But no one is telling us what four is. We need to find the fourth. So to do this, we are very lucky that we only have one more vector to find. And we are guaranteed that if we find what v perp is, it's just going to have one vector, or at least multiples of one vector, which will be our v4. And to find u4, you just divide by the normal. What if it was in five dimensions? I haven't even done the problem yet, but what if it was five dimensions? I had u1, u2, u3, but I needed to, f and v1, v2, v3, but we don't have four or five. The kernel will be two dimensions, and so you'll get two more vectors when we try to do this process. Unfortunately, they won't necessarily be orthonormal, and you'd have to do Gram-Schmidt on those two vectors. But anyway, I've never seen a question that nasty, so let's just proceed with this one. We have the following. V perp is the kernel of the matrix that is spanned by V1, V2, V3 as rows. So I'm going to take 1, 1, 1, 1. Notice that's V1 as a row. V2 is 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1. And V3 is 0, 2, 1, minus 1. What is another comment? What's another matrix that I could have used? Yes. Can anyone tell me another matrix that I could have used? to find v perp. I could have, no, not the reduced. Well, you were the loudest one. But I'm sure some, what do you think? Yeah, I could have used a half, a half, a half, a half, a half, a half minus a half minus, as in u1, u2, u3. So you could also use u1, u2, u3, because they have the same span. Why did I choose v? Because I don't like halves. Look, this is much easier. Okay, But you, you should get the same answer, so check this. Um, so basically, I'm going to row reduce this thing to find out what the kernel is. That's similar to, well, not similar to, equivalent to, subtract 1. I get 0, minus 1, minus 1, 0. Here, I'll leave it as 2, 1, minus 1. Next, take that and make it into a plus. So I'm cheating. I should write it out again, but there you go. Subtract this row from these two here appropriately. So you get 1, 0, 0, 1. Uh, now subtract two lots of this row from here. And you will get 
zero. One minus two is minus one. And then again, change this to a plus and subtract from this row. And you get one, zero, zero, one, zero, one, zero, minus one, and zero, zero, one, one. So if I haven't screwed it up, that is exactly the row reduced. However, it's not quite the kernel. To get the kernel of this matrix, you need to find the free variable. So here the free variable is, say, t. And so this means that I have x1 plus t equals 0, x2 minus t equals 0, x3 plus t equals 0, and x4 by definition equals t. So you put the t's on the other side, and you'll find that x is equal to t lots of minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1. OK, so a fourth vector v4, which would work, so v perp is the span of v4, where v4 is this vector minus 1, 1, minus 1, 1. And therefore, to make it in an orthonormal, take u4 is v4 over the length of v4. And as we've seen, 1, 1, 1, 1 adds up to 4. The length is 2. And so you'll get minus a half, 1 half, minus a half, 1 half. And that's it. Now, before we just break, why do I know? Why do I not have to do another round of Gram-Schmidt? Why is that vector already guaranteed to be orthogonal to the other three? And you can check it, do a reality check, and you'll see that if you, if you do the dot product, you will indeed get zero. So why already do I not have to do another Gram-Schmidt? You already checked, so that's why we went through. Yeah, basically, well, what I've checked is that this vector here is the kernel of this matrix. So this, the dot product of u4 with v1, v2, and v3 is zero. Hence, anything in the span of v1, v2, and v3. But u1, u2, and u3 are all in the span. So indeed, it would have been more obvious that u4 was perpendicular if I used the u1, u2, u3 rows as the, well, the vectors as the rows. But still, if we understand what's going on, we will not be surprised when everything in v perp is already perpendicular to everything that we found. All right, so any questions about that? Any questions before we break? Yes, please, please. We have a few seconds to spare at least. I know, I know. OK, what's your question quickly? It's not, it's coincidental that they all end up being a half in a way, but not really because R4, four lots of a quarter is one. But it doesn't have to, in R4, it doesn't always have to be a half. OK. Well, OK. We'll come back at a 10 o'clock, please. 10 o'clock. Go and get your food. I have found what I think are the most important categories, and there are five of them. So let's start with matrix basics. Okay, matrix basics. Remember, A, N by M, means N rows, M columns. It corresponds to a linear transformation from Rm to Rn. So note the confusion here is that the domain is M, the range is N, or the image codomain rather is N, and yet the matrix is written as N by M. It's sort of counterintuitive, so bear that in mind. Okay, now you want to know, multiply a matrix times a vector, and of course for this to make sense the vector has to be M dimensional. And I want to present two ways of doing it. So the first way is that if you consider A as a column matrix, and of course there are M columns, and X as the vector X1 up to Xm, this is a vector which looks like X1 lots of V1 plus X2 lots of V2, and so on up to Xm lots of Vm. And this is the conceptual approach. 
So now that we understand these things, this is a linear combination of the columns of A with coefficients x1 through xm. So this is a linear combination of coles of A. Okay? Excellent. Next. The other way of seeing it is if you think of it as row vectors, and there are now n of them, but they're all m-dimensional, times x is equal to a vector whose components are the dot products of the individual rows, all m of them, n of them. In both cases, you get an n-dimensional vector. You get the same vector by the definition of the dot product. You get the same vector. But this is the practical way to compute. You've noticed I multiplied various things. I always went, you know, I had a matrix. I, I didn't explicitly draw columns or rows, but I, I went like this, dick, dick, and I went, brunk, 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 filled in the first entry, then crunk, crunk, and so on. So when I say this is practical, this is how I compute it. But it's no good always computing it and even knowing this formula without realizing this as well, because they're two sides of the same coin. All right. To solve ax equals b, and this is going over really old stuff, but it's amazing how easy it is to sort of forget it or underappreciate it. When you come back to it, it makes a lot more sense. To solve ax equals b, what you do is you form the augmented matrix AB, and you do your operations, which I'm not going to go over, until you get the reduced form of the augmented matrix. And the whole point is that these reduction operations that you're allowed to do do not change the solutions. And you can also reverse them. So the solutions of this, so the fact is solutions of this, which are much easier to find, are all the, so this, the solutions of the original. So what this means, this when you've reduced it, you sort of have a new matrix and a new vector. So it's a new problem, A new x equals B new. But the x's that solve it are the same. Now, if you get a row like this, all zeros except for the augmented one, where this is non-zero, say 1, or any non-zero. If you get this, then there's no solution. And the equation AX equals B is called inconsistent. So that terminology means no solution. They write the words inconsistent just to be difficult. All right? On the other hand, if there are free variables, which I want to think of as columns without a leading one. In the RREF, the reduced. If there are free variables, then give them names and solve by writing out the equations. OK, so in order to demonstrate this, I'm not going to give too many examples along the way, because this is more of a sort of a summary. But there are going to be a few archetypes of problems. And, and this one, I give an example. So suppose you try to solve this system. I'll write it in the matrix form, and it's already going to even be reduced. Just make sure you can do this. It seems bloody obvious. But I've seen many falter. So let's just do it. There's a leading one. There's a leading one. 
it's already reduced row echelon form, meaning that all the other entries in those columns are zero. If not, you can take away suitable multiples to get the zero. Okay, so the free variables are this, R, S, and T. I pick the columns without the ones and I give them letters. Of course, you could call it X2, X3, X5, but I kind of like just to use simple letters just so we really can see what's going on. So this says, let's do an equation, and then we have to do an equation for X1. Well, it says X1 plus 2R plus 0S plus 3T equals 4. In other words, x1 is equal to 4 minus 2r minus 3t. How about two? Well, it doesn't really have an equation because x2 is just r. So I'll copy that. x2 equals r. x3, on the other hand, is s. Oh, that's what I called it. So let's just squeeze this in. x3 equals s. On the other hand, x4 plus 5 lots of t. x4 plus 5t is 6. So x4 is 6 minus 5t. And finally, x5 is just t. So that's the solution, but let's come over here and consolidate it as a vector. x, the vector, is equal to well, look over here. What constants do you have? 4, 0, 0, 6, 0. How many R do we have? Minus 2, 1, 0, 0, 0. S only comes up in the third coordinate, 0, 0, 1, 0, 0. That's a little trap. I've seen many people miss that. T minus 3, 0, 0, minus 5, 1. And that's it. So it's, the, it's this vector plus the span of these three. It's not actually a subspace. Not actually a subspace because of this. Without the constant, it would be a subspace. It would be the span of these three. But as it happens, it's a bit worse than that. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about matrix basis. Basics, not bases. All right, well, that only took eight minutes. Jolly good. It gets a little more difficult. Matrix multiplication and inverses. Okay, so here's one important thing. So you have A times B. We want to compute that. Uh, a is an N by P matrix. B is a P by M matrix. And the easiest way to conceptualize this, and also a nice way to compute it, is you take A, the matrix, and you consider the columns of B. B1 up to BM m columns of b. So if you just look at the vectors on the right matrix and you do the matrix multiplication of a times b, which we already know how to do, it's, it's somehow that's easier, then you just, that forms the columns of the a matrix, of the a b matrix rather. And this is consistent with the computation. You take this, this, it goes here, second row, first column here, third row, first column there, and you work your way down, bottom row, first column there. Of course, you can also work your way with the first row and all the columns and fill in the top entries. That's cool too. But basically, this is something that is important to understand. If you have a whole bunch of matrix equations, in fact, then you combine them into a matrix equation like this. So for example, if you know that A, B1 equals X1, the same matrix A, B2 equals X2, say, for these vectors, well, hey, you can already write down A times a 2 by, uh, a, a P by 2 matrix, B1, B2 equals X1, X2. And actually, you could use a row reduction on the 
well, I've, I've kind of screwed up the, the, the variables, I guess, but you could use a row reduction on A, the double variable. You don't just have to have one column on the right. You could have two on the right and you actually get both solutions at the same time for free. There's no need to do the reductions on A and X and then repeat the reductions on A and X too. You can get them both at the same time. And we use that sort of fact when we find the inverse of a matrix by putting a, a big matrix, you put the identity here and then we'll come back to that in a few seconds. All right, so two facts, three facts, facts to be aware of. A, B times C is A times B, C. So if you have to multiply three matrices together, you could multiply the first two first and then multiply that one by the last. Or you could start with the last two. That's fine too. Useful. A, B is not equal to B, A for most pairs in general. Sometimes it is, but sometimes it's not. And finally, if a, B is the identity, and A and B are both square, meaning N by N, then they're inverses of each other. Then B is A inverse, and A is B inverse, and of course B, A is also equal to the identity because uh, a matrix commutes with its inverse. Okay, so those are three facts about matrix multiplication. The last one I've thrown in the inverse. So a little bit about inverses. And multiplication. So if A and B are both invertible, so is AB the product. Only square matrices can be invertible. I'm not even writing that down, but I probably should. AB inverse is B inverse A inverse. So you have to reverse the order. After all, AB itself is the transformation where you do B first and then A. So if you want to undo that, you have to do undo A first and then B. Undo B. That makes some sort of sense if you think about it. Now, uh, to find the inverse, as I mentioned, you set up A and I n, so this is actually n by n, and this is also n by n, and you do your row reductions, and you get I n a inverse. That's all you have to do, if you're lucky. If not I n, meaning that you have some, it's not just ones, but you have some columns or rows that don't contain a leading one, then, in fact, A is not invertible. So it's also simultaneously a test to see whether the matrix that you had is invertible. You just try to invert it, and if you don't get the identity here, you give up, and there's no A inverse. Okay, so next, if it's a two by two matrix, then you should just learn this formula. The inverse is you switch the non-diagonal, uh, the diagonal elements and stick a minus sign in front of the non-diagonal elements, but don't, get, don't forget to divide by the determinant AD minus BC. So this quantity debt, the determinant of ABCD is AD minus BC. But even if you don't want to deal with determinants until after the midterm, you can just remember that formula and you don't even need to say determinant. If this is zero on the denominator, it's not invertible. So this uh, inverse does not exist if AD minus BC equals zero. 
So it's not just that the formula breaks down and you need a different formula. Actually, there is no inverse. I mean, you can show that. All right. Finally, uh, this sort of ties into the change of basis stuff, but even more primitively, if you know that T of V1 equals W1 and so on, up to T of Vn, say, is Wn. And A is the matrix. So this means A V1 is W1, and so on. A Vn is Wn. So the only difference is T is the transformation, and A is the matrix of T. And by what I was saying before, you can, you can consolidate these into a big old matrix. A times V1, V2, the matrix whose columns are, say, V1 through Vn. And this is the matrix whose columns are W. So I just want you to understand, all I've done is stuck together all these equations, glued them up vertically, but that's valid. And now, if you're lucky, this is in a square matrix, which is invertible. And so I'm going to say A, V equals W. And then to find A, you multiply on the right by V inverse. And so without being an example, this is a template of one way to find a matrix where all you know is what it does to a basis. So it's not really, it's a little bit more primitive than the change of basis. But nevertheless, uh, it's quite straightforward. I did an example once, and I, I can do some more in the Q&A. A oh, really quick question. Um, so is every FIN matrix in a invertible? OK, so the question is, is every n by n matrix necessarily invertible? And the answer is no. The answer is no. Not all square matrices are invertible. They have to have rank n or zero kernel. So here's an example of a two by two matrix that's not invertible. I'll stick it on the other board. Well, they would have to be a, a basis if you can invert it. So the answer is yes. I mean, if you're lucky, they're a basis. If you're unlucky, they're not. But then you don't really know what A is <laughs> because you don't have enough information. You have a redundant piece of information. OK, so uh, here's a 2 by 2 matrix that's not invertible. It's already in reduced form, but its determinant is 0. It cannot be invertible. In fact, this is a projection onto the first coordinate. So it sends x1, x2 into just x1. And therefore, you don't know what x2 was because you've thrown it away. So it can't be invertible. All non-invertible 2 by 2 matrices have AD minus BC equals 0. For 3 by 3 and higher, you need to deal with N by N determinants, and that's after the midterm. We will do it. All right, for those of you who have just come in, I'm really running late, and I'm doing my full review of the, uh, of the course. But only even the first two out of five sections, I've actually finished uh, the first two sections now. Okay, so I'm still on some sort of nice time. Okay. Part three. Subspaces span linearly independent basis. Okay, so let's review all these concepts. Subspace V is a subspace, three conditions. Three conditions. First, 0 is in V, the 0 vector. Cannot have an empty subspace in particular. Second condition, if x and y are in V, so is x plus y. So you cannot bust out of a subspace by taking the sum of two vectors in it. And the third condition is if x is in the subspace so is kx, every multiple of k, for any scalar k. 
So those are three easy enough things to check in general. Here's a question. Fix a matrix A and a vector B. Let's say A is, in my question, what do I want? Uh, N by M. M by M. And vector B in Rn. And consider V is the set of all x in Rm such that Ax equals B. So I have a given matrix A and a given vector B in maybe the image of A. And I want to know what are all the x's that get mapped to B. Or maybe they're not in the image. Who knows? Whatever the case, I want to know, is this a subspace? Is V a subspace? Who thinks that it is? Who's, who thinks that it isn't? Who doesn't think? Good. OK. <laughs> well, <laughs> let's just check the conditions. So let's just check the first condition. Is 0 in V? Well, is 0 in V? If it is, then A times 0 has to equal B. Right, because A x equals B for all x in this magical set V. And if 0 is going to be in the magical set, then A 0 is B. Of course, A 0 is 0. So actually, the answer is no, unless B happens to be equal to 0. If B is the 0 vector, then how would you describe V? We haven't done it yet in this summary, but how would you describe it? In that case, how would you describe V in terms of the matrix A? It's all the vectors x such that AX equals 0. What is that? That's the kernel of A, which is a subspace, which we've proved. So the small vector is mapped to a given vector is never a subspace unless that vector is 0, in which case it is a subspace, because it's the kernel. OK. What do you mean when you say fixed? What do I mean if what? I just mean just imagine a particular matrix that I'm not going to write down. I don't mean that's variable. And A is not supposed to be variable. B is not supposed to be variable. X is supposed to be you know, the one that is free to meander around and, be, and map out the V, you know, flush out the V. OK? So whenever you see in math, fix this, it just means, OK, we're going to pick it and treat it as a constant for this problem. But as you see, I didn't entirely treat it as constant. I treated B as a constant, but then I said, well, what could B be to make it work? So it wasn't quite as fixed as all that. All right. Uh, OK, so that's the little question just to give you a flavor of subspace questions, because we didn't do many. Now, let's talk about span. Yeah. OK. We have m vectors. So just to remind you, span of v1 up to vm, not necessarily the same as n. These are n-dimensional vectors. This is the set of all linear combinations of these vectors. And you need to know how to be able to write down an arbitrary linear combination. Let's say the coordinates are, well, the coefficients are C. C1, V1 plus C2, V2 up to Cm, Vm. Nice. That's important. Now, the other thing that's important is that you ought to recognize, and, and when I say this set, I mean where, I should say, where C1 up to Cm are any real numbers. You, you allow them to be anything, and you flesh, you choose everything one at a time. Okay, there's infinitely many, so they start fleshing out a subspace. Uh, okay, then another way of writing this that's important is that you can write this as the set of all A times C, where C is any M vector. 
And A here is the matrix whose columns are V1 up to Vm. And remember, these are not necessarily linearly independent yet. So I want you to understand that if you take this matrix times the vector C1 up to Cm, just imagine the vector there, you get this linear combination. It's exactly what I wrote down before up there. It's gone now, but I, I wrote down when I did linear, when I did matrix times a vector. So you, you should be aware that this unpacks into this. And then finally, this is the image of A. That's the image of that vector by definition. If you hit it with every possible vector, A times every possible vector gives you the image. So this is subspace of Rn. So the span of any number of vectors is always a subspace. OK, so that describes span. Let's keep going and talk about linearly independent. So lin independent. It's important to know, we want to say what it means for these m vectors. Lin independent, I'm really scrimping on the words here. Linearly independent is the full term. This means the following, that if C1V1 plus C2V2 plus dot 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 plus CMVM equals the zero vector, then you only have the trivial solution where they're all zero numbers. The coefficients have to be all zero, i.e. only the trivial solution. I say the word trivial means it's obviously a solution, because you can see if you put these all zero, you will get zero. But the nice thing is that this is the reverse. That's the only solution. Okay? So that is what you mean by linearly independent. And that's quite a nice way of doing it. But Another way of looking at it is there are no redundant vectors in the span of these vectors. By which I mean you cannot omit any of them. If you took any of them away, then the span would be smaller. You wouldn't flesh out the entire subspace. So that's the same thing as saying that they're linearly independent. Another way of looking at it is that in terms of that other matrix A, A times C, the vector, equals 0 only if or only has unique solution C equals 0. That's the trivial. That's another way of writing this in matrix form. That means all the coefficients of C are 0. And another way of saying this is that the only vector in the kernel is the zero vector itself, i.e. the kernel of A is just the zero vector, where A again in both of these, I sort of pulled it out of thin air, but A is once again the, vec the matrix whose columns are the vectors V. Okay, so. One way to tell that a bunch of vectors is linearly independent is to try to solve this equation. I have to say, this works better for proofs. This is what you want to do for proofs, especially. But for computations, if you have a specific collection of vectors and you want to see whether they're linearly independent, you form this matrix and find the kernel. And I'll tell you how to find kernels very short. OK, so, you know. Theoretical versus practical, it's nice to know when to use which one. All right, still on topic number three of five. Could you explain AC with a zero only has unique solution? 
Okay, just really quickly. A has columns V1 through Vn. And C is the vector C1 up to Cn. So AC, the multiplication of that matrix by the vector, is exactly C1 V1 plus C2. So you get this. So if that is the zero vector, then all the components have to be zero and vice versa. So it's just another way of rewriting that, but in terms of matrices. All right, so moving on. Um, I've told you linearly independent. I've told you span. And so basis V1 through Vm is a basis of some subspace V if, and you need three things, zero, they all have to be in V, are actually in V, I call that condition zero. Uh, you need the span of V1, Vm is equal to V. So actually, you don't really need zero. I just want you to understand that implies zero. Uh, one implies a zero. So you just need that V1 up to Vm give you exactly V. None of them could be outside V, obviously, from this, because then the span would be bigger than V, say. But two, V1 up to Vm are linearly independent as well. OK, and the good intuition to have is this means that you have enough vectors. And this means you have not too many. See, you have to have enough to give you all of V. But if you have too many, then you don't need all of them. Some of them are redundant, and they're not linearly independent. OK, so I, I cannot stress. And if you have this understanding, you, will, you should be able to get all of these types of questions correct. So in particular, let me say that all, so there's two big facts, if I can find them. Okay, so facts, and then we move on to the next section. One, all bases of V have the same number of elements. So if you can do it with M, then no matter how you do it, there's M. And this is called the dimension of V. That's the number of elements in a basis. That's a nice fact. Two, if you have any vectors, w1, say, up to wk, if you have k vectors, so if you have this with k less than the dimension of v, and these are vectors in, if you have this in v, so any k vectors where you don't have as many as the dimension, then they cannot span V. Then the span of these Ws is not all of V. It's a subspace of V, but it's not the complete lot of V. You cannot make up V by spanning with fewer than the dimension vectors. Quick question. No, the dimension is the number of vectors in a basis. A basis is a set of vectors. It's, it's a collection of some small number of vectors. They don't, they don't have columns. I mean, the, the vectors are columns. OK, so the third fact is that, again, if you have w1, wk in v, this time with k bigger than dim v, then they are not linearly independent. You have too many of them. They just can't, they can't be. There's too many. And I guess there's a, a few companion facts that follow from this, that if m is the dimension of v, and v1 up to vm either a span v, 
as in the span equals v, or b are linearly independent. then it's a basis. So we said a basis has to both span and be linearly independent. But all bases have the same number of elements. So if you happen to know what that is, and you have that correct number, say m elements, that span v, then you automatically get the linearly independent for free. And vice versa, if you knew they were linearly independent, you automatically get the span for v. But only if you know you have the right number. So it's sort of useless unless you happen to know what the dimension is. And then you're in good shape. Speaking of good shape, <laughs> I'm getting there. I'm up to section four. Unfortunately, five is a little bit long. But maybe I'll do it quickly. We'll see. OK, so I don't think I can take any more questions until 11. And I'll take a little bit of a break. OK, 4 is about linear transformations, as well as kernel and image and rank, stuff like that. OK. so. If you have a linear transformation, T linear, I just remind you that means two things. T of x plus y equals T of x plus T of y for any pair of vectors x and y. And T of k scalar times x, the scalar comes right out. So that's what you need for linearity. Two conditions, both of them mean linear. Okay. Let's talk about kernel. Cur t. Well, first of all, t has a, bless you. If t goes from Rm to Rn, as I said, there's always a matrix A. And we always have a matrix A, which is n by m, such that t of x equals a times x. That goes without saying. There's a correspondence between linear transformations and matrices. And as we saw when we did other bases, there's actually not one, it's not really a linear transformation unique matrix. It's more like this. Linear transformation and basis together give you matrix. If you keep the same transformation but change the basis, you get a different matrix. But since it's more Anyway, that's an aside because we already did that. It's not part of the summary. All right, so we have this. It's important to know that the kernel of T, which is the same thing as the kernel of A, I mean, that's the kernel of a matrix, that's a kernel of a transformation. But uh, we consider this as the set of all vectors x in Rm such that Ax equals 0. It's a 0 vector. And you could change this to T of x. I don't want to get too bogged down as to whether it's T or A. But basically, this is a subspace of Rm the domain. It's a subspace of the domain. The image is a subspace of the codomain. But we'll do that in a second. Because, it has a, because it's a subspace, it has a dimension. The dimension of the kernel is called the nullity, but not very often. It's called the nullity, and I want to point out that it must be less than or equal to m. You cannot have the nullity or the dimension of the kernel bigger than M because it's a subspace of Rm. All subspaces have no more than the number of dimensions of their ambient space that their subspace is of. Can't, can't take a subspace and get more. OK, so a couple of facts. To find Kerr A, solve Ax equals 0. That's all you have to do. Which means, in effect, that you have to solve this. But unlike with another vector, any non-zero vector, you actually have to do the full augmentation. The beauty here is that you can just take A and reduce to R, R, E, F, A. You can just do that. You don't have to keep track of the zeros because all the operations preserve zero. So in other words, if you shove the zero here, you get the zero here. 
normally you can't do that, but you can just for the special case of zero. So you notice I actually did an example before. It was the last example I did before the break where I had the three vectors and I had to find v perp. I took a matrix and I wanted to find the kernel. I didn't bother writing zero, zero, zero on the right column. I just, I kind of just threw it in at the end. So that's a little tip is that you don't need to keep track of the zeros. Okay, so it's fine. It's fairly easy to find the kernel. You just reduce it to, it, it just becomes an RREF type of problem. Now, a more complicated thing is to find a matrix A with a given kernel. Ah, to find a matrix A with a given kernel, what you have to do is you have to look at this kernel. So suppose that you have a basis. Suppose that you have a basis given by, say, V1 up to Vm. But you, these are n vectors. Well, by definition, m has to be less than or equal to n. So you, they're n-dimensional vectors. So I haven't said the theorem yet, but here you'd want to use the rank nullity theorem and say the rank is equal to n minus the dimension of the basis, m, nullity, to find the rank. So e.g., if you're given five, five different, you're given two, two vectors like this, one, zero, zero, one, one, and three, one, two, zero, zero. Say you're given those two. Well, I see it's five dimensional. They're five dimensional vectors. So I, I need a matrix with rank equals five minus two, because there's two independent vectors. If that's going to be the kernel, so span, so what I'm trying to say is if this is, e.g., basis for kernel equals these two vectors, that's what I'm trying to say. I want a, a matrix whose, whose uh, kernel is the span of those two vectors. Then the rank of such a matrix has to be five, because they're five-dimensional vectors, minus two, because there's two of them. So it has to be three. So then scrounge around, so try RREF matrices with uh, the, the correct rank. So I may not finish this example, but the idea is I need a rank three. And so for rank three, I would try this. One, one, one. And then I just don't know what the other numbers have to be. So A, B, C, D, E, F. That's a simple enough one. Now, it may be that that works, or it may be that it's too complicated. So you, this is not the only possibility. Another possibility would involve, say, putting a zero here, but it's a little more risky. So what I'm trying to say is you can start shifting the one. If this doesn't work, you shift the ones around. But I'm afraid you're reduced to just solving, um, finding the kernel of this matrix, basically, and trying to guess what these numbers are. So it's not so bad. I mean, here you can see that a plus b plus 1 has to equal 0, whereas there, well, this is no good here. See, here's an example of where this is, fail, is going to fail. You take the top row dot this, and you don't get 0. So clearly this 1 cannot be correct. So in this case, you see, I want this times 3, 1, 2, 0, 0 to be equal to 0, but it's not. That's equal to 3. So I cannot have a 1 on the top row. So I, I scratch that, and I go for a different matrix, which is even simpler. 0, 1, 0, 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, B, 0, 0, 0, 1, C. And that's also rank 3, but now I've gotten rid of the 1 from the first column. And now, actually, that means I don't even have to worry about the, the 1 and the 3. And then I think you can easily solve for A, B, and C by requiring that they're both orthogonal to those two. So if you really want to do it, 
you find that A, if you dot it with this 1, 0, 0, 1, 1, here you find that A has to be 0. And that C has to be minus 1. Okay? Uh, also, you find that B has to be 0. Am I just working myself into a corner here? I'm going to come back to this problem. Uh, you can't do that. Okay, I'm going to come back to this problem because it's distracting me from the summary. I should have solved it first, but since I just made it up. And I'm short of time, I come back to it. Sorry. All right. Forging on. One other thing about the kernel. Another fact. Suppose you want to solve AX equals B, but you already know the kernel. You already know that the kernel of A is span of, say, V1, V2, and so on. I don't know how many there are. So suppose you already know that. If you just find one solution, if you find one solution, say x0, sometimes it's easy to just find one solution. It turns out that all solutions are x0 plus the span of this, c1, v1, plus c2, v2, I don't know, let's say there's m of them. And if you think back to one of the early examples I did when I had this matrix, I guess it was like 1, 2, 0, 3, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 whatever it was, two, the, the 2 by 5 matrix, you'll see we got a constant vector plus C1, V1, C1 time, I think I called it R, S, and T. And those three vectors were in the kernel. So this is called a particular solution, and this is the homogeneous solution. And if you ever studied any differential equations, that, that whole theory comes straight out of linear algebra, believe it or not, even though it doesn't look like it does. All right, so that's a little comment. Now, I'd better move on to image. What's the time? It's probably, okay, that was a nice dream to get it done in 55 minutes, wasn't it? Oh well. I'll just do what I can do in the next seven minutes. The image of T is the image of A, which by definition is the set of all AX where X is in RM. So you take any vector in RM and you hit it with A, and you see what you get. Another way of looking at it is it's the set of all B in RN such that AX equals B has a solution, is consistent. That's the image. And another way of looking at it is the span of the columns of A. Same thing. Now, it's a subspace of the codomain, Rn. OK. Uh, so let's see, what else do I want to say? Its dimension is the rank of A, by definition, just like the nullity. And this is equal to the number of leading ones. in the reduced row echelon form. But the, the uh, nullity is equal to the number of columns without the leading ones. In the reduced form. 
the number of free variables, basically. And therefore, since every column has either a leading one or doesn't, the ones that do contribute to the rank, the ones that don't contribute to the nullity, you have that the rank of A, which is the dimension of the image, plus the nullity of A, which is the dimension of the kernel, is equal to M, the number of columns of A. And sometimes in this class already I've used N here, but that was always an N by N matrix if you look back at the notes, so, or at least the N was that dimension. So it can get a little complicated if you remember M, it might be better to remember it as number of columns of A. Or the domain, the dimension of the domain of A. Okay, so this is a very important theorem. It's the rank nullity theorem, and there's plenty of examples, especially true false questions, which use it. I attempted to use it for my kernel question that I botched and that I'm hoping to come back to. Probably not on the video. All right, where are we at? Where are we at? We're almost done with this section. I just need to tell you about how to find images. Okay. To find the image, what you do is you can you find the leading columns, which are columns containing a leading one, in the reduced form. And then image of A has as a basis the corresponding columns, the set, okay, the corresponding coles of A. And what do I mean by corresponding? Well, if the first, second, and fifth column have ones in it, but the third and fourth don't, you take the first, second, and fifth column of A itself. Those are the vectors that you need. Not the reduced form. The reduced form is just 1, 0, 0, 0, 1, 0. That's not the correct basis. But it's really quite straightforward once you have the reduced row echelon form. On the other hand, to find A with a given image, say span, the image being the span of V1, this is a really simple thing to do. Just take A to be equal to the matrix whose columns. And there you have your matrix. Nothing to it. All right, here's the situation. It's 2 minutes to 11. I'm up to section 5, which is the final section, which is on special transformations, scaling, projections, reflections, etc. So I'd like to do it, and I offer Robert, our valiant cameraman, the chance to stay for 10 minutes or to leave. He'll stay. Jolly good. Yeah, give him a round of applause. He follows me for hours at a time, never complains, so he deserves that applause, not just for staying, but all of his work to date. So, thank you, Robert. Now, let's consider special transformations. This is the final section, and it actually goes back a little bit. So I didn't do this in order. Okay, there's five types of special transformations you're supposed to know. A, scaling. This is the matrix K times the identity for some number K. We looked at it in two dimensions, but in three dimensions, this is, it's a diagonal matrix where all the entries are K and all the others are zero. So it just multiplies every coordinate by K. It is invertible. And the inverse is 1 over k times i n. So it's the diagonal matrix with all 1 over k's. Now this is assuming k not equal to 0. Of course, if k equals 0, it's not a very interesting scale. It's actually the 0 matrix, which doesn't really count. All right, so that's all I have to say about scaling. It's not very interesting. Now, uh, somewhat more interesting is projections. Now, we've looked at projections a variety of different ways today. And I'm going to summarize sort of what we had. So first of all, if you have one vector, you ought to know this formula. The projection is x dot v 
over v dot v, or if you prefer that's the bottom is the length of v. You can write, if you prefer, you can have length of v squared on the bottom. But if v is a unit vector, you get the simpler formula that we've looked at before. x dot u, lots of u, or u dot x. It doesn't matter which order you write it in. This is for unit u. And it's obvious to see why that's true. The denominator is 1. Uh, no, no. This is v dot v is the length squared. Yeah, the length is the square root, but you actually want v dot v, not the square root. It's important to put the square of the length there. OK, so that's, that's the projection of x onto a vector. And again, geometrically, it looks like this. v, it doesn't matter what multiple of v you have. It describes a line. x is up here. The projection is a multiple of v. It's some number times v. How much? It's as much to get the difference to be right angle to v. So this is the projection. Important to understand the geometry even in a simple case like that. Now, in two dimensions, you just use the formula. And by now we know, we just see what happens to uh, x in general. You can easily get a matrix for it. And we can look at some examples if they come up. But it might be worth learning the very simple formula use that formula, or you can use the fact that the projection is u1 squared, u2 squared, u1, u2, u1, u2. And that's true if you're projecting onto the unit vector u. This has to be unit. So it's sort of this formula here. But in the special case where you're in two dimensions and you've written u1 comma u2. So this is clearly u1 dot u1. This is u1, u2. It's, well, it comes out of that anyway. You, you apply this formula, this formula this one, zero, 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 one, and you get that. OK, so that might be worth knowing. Three dimensions is the complicated case because in higher dimensions, you can't really do anything without the general formulas. So in three dimensions, you have two possibilities. You could project onto a line, in which case I suggest, again, use the above formula to find that. So that's projection onto a line. That's a one-dimensional subspace. Very straightforward. However, you ought to know how to project onto a plane. Rather than using the fancy orthonormal methods that we've done, which you could. I mean, you could use Gram-Schmidt. We now know how to find v's and all projections, v perps, all that sort of stuff. Uh, it's nice to go back to the very, very basics. So here is my methodology. So for projection onto a plane, through the origin, you find a normal very easily. It doesn't have to be a unit. And remember, if the plane is 3x plus 4y minus 5z equals 0, you could take the normal as just the vector 3, 4, minus 5. That's normal to the plane. You just rip the coefficients out and stick them in a vector. That's the normal. OK, then you find the projection onto the normal line. Just like I said, use the standard projection formula. And say that's the matrix N. And again, we can do some examples of how to find N, but it was pre-quiz stuff in any case. So you find the projection matrix. That gives you, here's a line. There's the normal n. Here's your vector x that you're trying to project onto this plane. This is what we want. Unfortunately, what we've got is this. This is the projection onto n of x, whereas this is the projection onto the plane Well, now of x. Now we can understand that this is actually the projection onto v perp, and this is the projection onto v. 
the normal is the V perp, and the plane is the V. So, of course, the sum of the two is exactly x. So we're going to use the fact that x is the projection onto the plane of x plus the projection onto the perpendicular, the normal of x. So if you solve for this, you find the projection onto the plane, and you can do it geometrically as well. You see that you just take x minus the, the, the uh, projection onto n. to the normal. So this, of course, equals x minus nx. And so the matrix that you want is the identity minus the projection onto the normal. So we learned that before, but it's kind of nice to learn. In general, If a subspace V is the span of V1 up to Vm, even if they're not orthogonal, and V perp is the span of Vm plus 1 up to Vn, this is in Rn as usual. So V is spanned by m vectors, and V perp is spanned by the rest of them then projection onto V has matrix 1, 1, 1, 1, 0, 0, 0. There are M ones, and the rest are zeros, and everything else is zero. And this is the matrix with respect to this basis V1 all the way up to Vn. And the rationale is that the first m gets sent to themselves, whereas the last n minus m of them, which are orthogonal, gets sent to zero. So the matrix that you actually want with respect to the standard basis is just similar to this. So the number of ones is the dimension of the subspace that you're projecting onto. Okay. okay, one or two more things about projections, then I'll do reflections and then that's almost it. Okay, other facts. Also, P squared is equal to P for all projections. See, the deal is if you project onto V, you get something in V. And then if you repeat the projection, you get the same thing. You don't need to project twice. You're already in V. Okay, so P squared equals P. And P is not invertible. Projections are not invertible. Unless it's the trivial projection, which in this case is the identity. I guess the identity is the projection of Rn onto itself. So it doesn't do anything to any vector. So it's the identity. But that's kind of stupid. That's not a true projection. It's just the identity. OK, so it's important to know the projection is not invertible. OK, moving on. C. Reflections. Cause a lot of consequences, but they're really not too bad. First of all, in two dimensions, the reflection in U of x is equal to twice the projection on u minus x. So its matrix R is 2p minus the identity. Now why is that true? Well, here's u, here's x. I want to find the reflection. So I write x as the projection plus the perpendicular. So x is equal to x parallel plus x perp. But the reflection of x is x parallel minus x perp. 
That's important. That's true not just in two dimensions. That's true for any subspace. Right? If you can decompose x into its v part and its v perp part, the reflection in v keeps the v part the same and switches the v perp part, as in the complement part, around. So that's actually the definition of the reflection. So the reflection, according to this, is equal to the projection minus the perp. But the perp is itself x minus the projection. That's the definition of the perp, the difference between x and its projection. So actually, you get twice the projection minus the vector. So actually, in any number of dimensions, actually, in any, in general, the reflection of x in V, in any subspace, is twice the projection minus x. Or in matrices, R is 2P minus the identity, because the identity times x is x. So that's well worth learning. That's true in any number of dimensions. Okay, so it's 2 and it's true in n. Now one thing, though, is when you go to three dimensions, something confusing happens. And I'm just going to try to clear it up for once and for all. The book is very confusing about it, I have to admit. So I've thought about it, and this is how I intend to clear it up. In three dimensions, it's still true that R is 2P minus i for projection. So this is for reflection or and projection in a plane. The problem is that the, the formula I gave you for p was equal to i minus n, where this is the projection onto the plane. But to work it out, you work out the projection onto the normal. So if you try to consolidate these two, they consolidate as follows. R is twice P minus I, which works out to be I minus 2N. So it's a lot of stuff like this, which was confusing. This is confusing, but this is the way you computed it the three dimensions. So I want you to understand that the general formula still works provided that you use the same projection and the same reflection. But this projection onto a plane is really, you get it from the projection onto the V perp. So it's a little bit confusing, but that's how those formula work. work. In general, R is similar to 1, 1, 1, minus 1, minus 1, with m of these, where m is the dimension. I'm not going to say anything more. It corresponds to that previous matrix. But instead of the zeros, to kill off the perp, you actually put minus 1 to flip, up, to flip the perp. Also, r is invertible because r squared is the identity. r squared is the identity. If you reflect and then reflect again, you get the original one back. And you can prove it easily from the projection formula. So in other words, sorry? Was that fun? OK. So <laughs> this means that R is its own inverse. Reflections are their own inverses. OK, that's all I have to say about reflections. Finally, almost finally. I just remind you, rotations, they only exist in two dimensions as far as we're concerned. I won't talk much about, I just want to say that this matrix is the rotation counterclockwise by theta. It's invertible. In fact, the inverse, you just flip the minuses around since the determinant is 1. So that's fairly straightforward. 
And there's this stuff about shears. Uh, there's one question in a previous midterm that involves a shear that is not either horizontal nor vertical, but that's not in this book, so it's not in the course. I don't know how it slipped in there. But it might be worth remembering, although I've never seen any other question about it, that this is a vertical shear and that this is a horizontal shear and that they are invertible. Just replace k by minus k. And that will do it. That will do it. All right. So basically, uh, that's the end of my one hour and 10 minute summary of everything up to 3.4, 5.1, 5.2. Now I seem to have covered everything. There's a quick question over here. No, no, this is for projection onto any subspace V and the reflection in the same subspace. It's very general. It works for any projection onto any subspace. All right, we're going to take a 10 minute break and then at 11.25 we will finally start Q&A. And that's the end of the video.